sorry guys, it says for some reason the live stream ended. I don't know what happened. So I'm trying to do this again. Let me try. Am I okay now? Mm -hmm. I don't know where I left off. I'm trying to get back on my thing. Am I okay? Yes, you're okay, sweet. I'm okay. Okay. So and everywhere Jesus went, right? Everywhere Jesus went. There was always a crowd. There was always a crowd. So now we have here, he's like, okay, you know what? I have to get away from here and just go to other villages. Because everywhere he went, there's a crowd. And he went to other villages. And then picking up in Mark chapter 2, he came back to Capernaum. Right? He came back to Capernaum. My whole thing is messed up here. Right. Sorry. Is it okay? Okay, where are we at? right? Mark chapter 2. It says, and again he entered in Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. Not, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. I'm reading from the King James Version. And they came unto him bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And Jesus saw their faith, and he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that what they reasoned within themselves, he said to them, why are you reasoning these things in your hearts? Is it easier to say the sick, is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven, or say, take up your bed and walk? But that ye may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he has saved, he saved to the sick of the palsy. And I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine own house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Isn't God good? So this is what's going on. A man is sick. I can't see. You want mine? No, that's okay. That's okay. Anyway, my sister says I, I can't see. All right, that's okay. So this is what's happening, right? So remember, Mark 1, he's all God. Everyone's gathering around him. Here we are in Mark chapter 2. He comes back to Capernaum, right? And look, and it was noise. So people heard that Jesus Jesus in the house, man. Jesus Praise is God. in the house. He's in the house. Praise God. Jesus is in the house. Praise Jesus. But he's just not only in this house. He's, he's in your house, your house, your house. Jesus is in the house, right? Jesus is in the house, and look what happens. It says they gathered. Everyone gathered. There was no room. There was no room. Have you ever been to, I don't know, an event where there's really no room to get around, right? I know y'all Caribbean's been to Labor Day Parade, okay? <laughs> and there's no room to move. You've been to concerts. There's no room to move. So imagine just all of this, right? How about the Macy's Day Parade? Now, y'all don't do that, right? Y'all don't do Macy's Day. <laughs> y'all don't do the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Y'all do the La Labor Day Parade, right? <laughs> anyway, so this is what's happening. There is no room 
right, to get in the house. This is how good God is. At the name of Jesus, this is what should happen. People should come, right? But look what's, look what's happening here, right? So there's no room to get in. Can you imagine when you see someone coming, a, a, a lame man on a bed, and it's not like a bed, like the, like the therapeutic bed, like the remote control for your body. It's a mat, right? It's a mat and something that they can fold up. This man has palsy, he's lame, he's paralyzed. He cannot move, he cannot move. I thought back, I said, God, how many times have I been paralyzed? I know you, you, and you had a period where, uh, in life where you were paralyzed, not physically, right? We were all at one point spiritually paralyzed, but this man is physically paralyzed. Now just picture this in your head. This man is paralyzed. He's trying to, okay. he's trying to get to Jesus. Is this still frozen? No. No? If you would. Okay. Mine is frozen on here. Mine is Yours is still good. Here, take mine. Because if, if someone's, I'm sorry to you all, I don't know what's going on. I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on. It's probably the update. I might think it's update. Okay. So this man is paralyzed. He's Jesus is in the house. They need to get to Jesus. There's no room. There's no room. Wouldn't you think if you see someone paralyzed, wouldn't you move out the way? Right. Wouldn't you move out the way? So right here, you have two groups of people, I'm thinking, in this place that's gathered around to see Jesus. You have a group of people that, you know what, I would move out the way, but I need healing myself, mm -hmm. right? I need healing myself. And then you have another group of people that I'm just gonna go like the scribe, and I'm gonna put, cross my hand, and I'm gonna see what's gonna happen. Jesus. You have, always in life, you have two sets of people. You have people who are genuine, and you have people who are critical. Yeah. They just have something to say looking for something to say. So the place, the house, there's no room, right? So what do they do? They say, you know what, man, we can't get to him this way. Look where determination, look where determination gets you. Because you have to picture a crowd of people, to them, it was an obstacle. They couldn't get to God. It's an obstacle. We have obstacles in our life we have obstacles. We've been through periods in our life where we have been paralyzed. We said we're not going to church. Even if we did go to church, we just didn't feel. We just didn't feel. You know, something wasn't connected. You're sitting there. I'm trying to praise God, but I can't praise God. Right? I can't praise God. Only you know why you were paralyzed. Right? Only you know what caused your paralysis. You know. I don't know. But we've all been through some point in our life where, you know what, we're not moving. We're just, we can't move, right? So the man, he was paralyzed, but they had, he had four friends, right? He had friends who carried him, right? God said, if you want friends, you got to show yourself friendly. Okay? <laughs> he, imagine if he didn't have any friends. Okay. Imagine if he didn't have any friends. But this man had friends. His friends moved into action. His friends had faith. When you have faith, faith is action attached to faith, right? Faith without works is dead. It's yes. dead. Yes. You got to do something. Yes. You have to do something. So what did they do? I'm all over the place. What did they do? They said, you know what? We can't get to Jesus because people are crowding around, right? We can't get to Jesus. So what we're going to do is we're going to take off the tiles of the roof. We're going to climb the roof, right? And in those days, they had a flat roof. Before, back in April, my husband was talking, preaching about this. You want to talk about the flat roof, honey? All right. Honey, evangelist? <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, the flat roof, that was by law, it had to be that way, you know, from the, from the, from the Old Testament, it, it had to be flat. And the way this 
particular roof was built, it, it, the Bible says at tiles. That means it, it was made out of clay. Mm -hmm. So um, the clay was hardened, of course. So it, it was very difficult to make a hole, right? Even if you had like tools, whatever, it was really difficult. Now, now, the, now in those days, the roof was, was like an extra room. People sometimes would sleep on it. I, I don't know if you guys remember in the book of Acts, when uh, Peter was on the roof and the Holy Spirit spoke to him to eat all the, whichever food this is, yeah, it, it's good to eat. So um, they, they used to bring also guests up, a, a guests in that roof too. But in that particular day, um, they dug a hole, right? Plus also the ladder, don't forget the ladder. Mm -hmm. There was a, in each of these homes, there was always a ladder so they could climb into mm -hmm. the roof. Right, right, so the roof was flat. It was, flat. it was flat. And some of these homes may have had a stairways, but most of them had a ladder, but there was some type of um, access to the roof, right? So remember when and David was on the roof? And there was also a, a gate around that roof so nobody would yeah, fall. There was a gate around the roof, yeah. right? So you remember like David, wasn't David on the roof when he saw Bathsheba, David, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of stuff takes place on their roof. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> The stuff takes place on that roof, right? And if you know Proverbs 21 9, if you turn to Proverbs 21 9, it says, you know what? It's better to live in the corner of a roof than to deal with the quarrelsome wife. I said, well, why the wife gotta be quarrelsome? Why the wife gotta be why is the wife gotta be quarrelsome? Right? So Solomon said, listen, if that wife is giving you a headache, just go in the corner of the roof and stay there, right? So a lot of stuff takes place on the roof. So what these people did, they had their friend who was wounded. I thought about when my dad was in the army, when he fought the Vietnam War, and he would say how the soldiers would be wounded on a battlefield, right? And the friend, people would go, you, you see it, you go out and you try to drag your friend, right, to safety. This is what these people did, right? You need friends that have your faith, right? You need friends that's going to push you, right? You don't need friends to be, oh, well, well, that's your problem. You're that's paralyzed, right. man. That's your problem. You know, I'm going to do me. Amen. I hate when people say that. I hate that. It's a passion. Do you, do you. I don't like that. Anyway, because when you do you, you're not doing what's spiritual. You need to do it, right? Your stuff. It's, it's flesh. Yeah. When people say, do you? Oh, he did that to you. Girl, do you. Do you. No, 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 no. Do what the word says. Mm -hmm. right? Do what the word says, and you would always have a peace of mind. I'm telling you. Like, because when I get to this age, we only get to this age, right? There's life's experience. Good morning, Sister Gladys. My sister says they're going to help their friends by any means necessary. Amen. Right? So th let's, let's just get to the meat of the story. Right? So this is what happened. They let their friend up on the roof. They removed the tiles, right? Can you imagine Jesus is there teaching and preaching and tiles and debris is falling, right? You're like, hey, what's going on, right? So however they did it, they lowered their friend down, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know what? I'm determined for my friend. This is my friend, right? What, oh my goodness, when you have a friend like this, so they did what they had to do, to, you have to be bold. And it shows how the friends were not selfish people. They were not selfish no, people. They, they moved on behalf of their friend, right? So here, once again, they had to go through the roof because the people were standing there. They're able-bodied people. They're not even, they're not even, moving out the way. They're able-bodied. They're not even moving out the way. They said, that's okay. Y'all can stay there. I'm going to go around. I have a plan B. I'm going to go around because I'm determined. Do you remember the lady when Elijah had told the woman, he said, you're going to have a son. The lady had a son, the Shunammite woman, I believe it was, and her son died. And then she went, wanted to go to Elijah to say, wait, you know, you, you promised me a son. Now my son died. Right, but then Elijah's servant wanted to talk to the lady. Mm -hmm. Right, that lady said, "Uh, uh, get out of my way. I gotta get to the man of God. Okay, I gotta get to the man. I gotta get to Jesus. Amen. I gotta get to Jesus. So 
So that's what happened. Each friend says, okay, there's a crowd, no problem. I'm gonna open up the roof. I'm gonna remove the tile. I don't care, debris falling, something falling or someone's head right there. They're crazy. Doing yourself like this. <laughs> What's going on? But I'm gonna lower my friend down mm -hmm. because this is my friend. I want my friend to be healed. I want my friend to be healthy, right? This is what friendship is all about. So these five men believe that Jesus could heal. You heard it going around. He healed the leper. Jesus said, don't tell nobody. The leper's telling everybody, right? So look what happened in verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, he said, son, he called him son. He said, your sins are forgiven. Who said anything about sins? I just want to be healed, right? I just want to be healed. Where do sins come in? on this. But Jesus saw their faith. He said, I see their faith. But you know what? I'm going to say to you, your sins are forgiven. That goes to show that Jesus knows what we're thinking. I know you could see, we could see whatever we could see. But Jesus knows. I could say, you know what, God? I need this whatever to heal. You all see it. But in my heart, you don't know. I'm saying, God, can you forgive me for whatever? God, forgive me, right? So the paralyzed man, even though he needed healing inside, internally, he was asking for forgiveness, right? He's asking for forgiveness because, right, God knows our heart. God knows our heart. So right then, God spoke to that man's heart, and he says, I'm going to forgive you. I forgive you. Nowhere in the Bible in the beginning of the, it said anything about sin. Nowhere said nothing about sin. Nowhere said nothing about forgiveness. This is what the first mention of it. So God knows our heart. He said, your sins, I'm going to forgive you. Right? So look what happens. Look what happens. So Jesus forgave the man's sins. Right? And right there, when God forgives our sins, he's saving us. Yeah. He's saving us. So right then, that man got saved. He saved what God, right? Because the Bible says, if you don't forgive each other, how is God going to forgive you? Right? I could forgive you of offenses. You offended me, blah, blah, blah. I could forgive you. But only God has the authority to forgive Amen. sins. Amen. Right? And that's what this whole, that's what Mark is trying to portray. Um, who Jesus was, the person, and his authority. Right? Jesus says, I'm going to forgive you. Right? So even when he talked about, you know what, I see your faith, right? And if you turn to Hebrew, Hebrews 11, it talks about faith. It says, like, Abraham went to um, sacrifice Isaac through faith. Um, Cain presented a better offering than Abel through faith, right? It was Cain, Abel, right? Abel. Abel presented a better offering than Cain through faith. In Hebrews 11, it just talks about faith. Everyone, what everyone did through faith, through faith. And believing, you have to believe. I don't see it, physically see it, but I believe that it's going to happen. I believe I'm going to get the victory after this. Yes, my sister said, go to the source when I was talking about the lady Elijah. They love their friend and it's all about faith. Right? I'm going to go to the source. Right, By any means necessary, I have to get to Jesus to heal whatever is going on in my life. Because I can't do it by myself. I, and we can't do it. That's why God made people to interact with each other, to have relationships with each other. You're supposed to have friends. Even if you, you don't need a whole lot of friends. Right? You just need a few good friends. Even if you have one. Right? If you had one, but this man happened to have four because they all had calcium, right? So look at what happens here, right? So in verse six, it says, "But there were certain of the scribes. These scribes, these scribes, these scribes make make that on my nerves. <laughs> Every time you see the scribes and the Pharisees, they just get on my nerves." It says, "These scribes, look, they were sitting there reasoning in their hearts, right? So the scribes." were the people, they were Jewish sect. You have the Jewish people, you have certain sects, sects, right? The scribes wrote the laws. 
they wrote the laws. So they know what they wrote, right? They wrote the laws, and then, right, you have the Pharisees that were the religious leaders, and they thought they did everything right. They were self-righteous. According to the law, there was the Pharisees, oh, well, they did this, and they did that, right? So now here you have the scribes, and it says they was reasoning in their hearts. They didn't even verbalize it. They were, it was, they were thinking this in their hearts, right? They was in their hearts, and they said, basically, how does this man speak blasphemy, right? Because Jesus says to the man, he says to the man, I forgive you of your sins. Now, remember, they wrote the law. So in Leviticus 13, in Leviticus 13 and 14, if you blaspheme, meaning if you put yourself on the same level as God, it's blasphemy. And blasphemy, the result of blasphemy is death, right? So the scribes, but they didn't say it out loud. It said they reasoned in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins? Only God, right? So you can't put yourself on the same level as God. It's death. They wrote the law. They wrote the law. So they're there they're sitting there. But they're, it says they're reasoning in their hearts. See, they're smart enough not to say it, all right? It doesn't matter. God knows your heart. Because the lame man, God said, your sins are forgiven. It said nothing about sins. He just wants to get healed. His friends just want him to get healed. But God knows your heart. So that lame man, I'm just putting my thought in it, had to have been asking for forgiveness of sins. For Jesus to say, I forgive your sins. Because he's just being willing to get healed, according to his friends. So the scribe said, why does this man speak blasphemy? Only God can forgive. Like, here we go, these scribes. Didn't they get on your nerves? Didn't they get on your nerves? Look, and ver in verse 8, it says, And immediately when Jesus perceived this in their heart, so Jesus perceived this in his spirit, he knew what their heart was saying. God knows your heart. So I don't know why people judge people by how they look or what they're doing. God knows your heart. God knows when you're broken. God knows when you're crying. You could be smiling on the outside. God knows you are crying on the inside. God knows when you are not confident. God knows when you doubt yourself. God knows it. God knows your heart. You could act like you're strong all you want. God knows that inner battle, what's going on. He knows. Just confess it. Just confess it. Ain't no sense in trying to cover it up because God knows. God knows. God, my sister said, God knew what they were thinking. He, he knows your thoughts. Amen. Right? He knows your thoughts. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's omnipotent. He knows everything. He's omniscient. He knows all things. Right? So this is the God you serve. My sister said, in those days when you were blind, paralyzed, etc., they felt it was because of sins. Of the parent or the sins, yeah, that's, and that's how it is today too. You know when people are going through something, oh, they must have sinned, right? But no one's thinking about Job. Job was always praying. He went and he prayed for his family daily. He Job asked for forgiveness on behalf of his family daily. Job's there minding his business, and here comes the enemy going to and fro and have a whole conversation with God. You know, like he wants to stir something up. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? Like, God, why you got to pick me? <laughs> like, why you got to pick me? Have you considered my servant Stephanie? I'm not Stephanie no more. I'm Steph Steph or something. <laughs> right? So people think, like, because you're going through something, it's the sins of your parent. It's the sins, maybe what you committed, right? But no one knows that, you know what? God is putting you through the test to strengthen you. Because in Revelation, it says the devil goes and he accuses us every day. Why are you giving them more grace? They don't deserve it. Remember um, Jonah, right? God told Jonah, go to Nineveh and tell them to repent, right? Jonah said, I'm not going to Nineveh. Nineveh is deadly. I'm going to Tarshish. He went the other way, right? Because Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh because he felt that they didn't deserve God's forgiveness. Right? 
right? And people are like that. Why are, you, why are they getting forgiven, right? right? And that's what was happening. Yeah, God strengthens us, and that what was that's what was happening. So you had they said, why is this man committing blasphemy? Only God. So Jesus said immediately he perceived in his spirit what they was reasoning. Look, and he said to them, why are y'all reasoning these things in your hearts? This is how, and no one, and it still didn't click to them that this is God, right? Even today, you have the Jewish, some Jewish people that don't believe Jesus is Lord and Savior. They don't. I work with some. They only believe in the Old Testament. That's it. To this day, I, I work with one, one on one every day, right? But the thing about it, Everyone is respectful of everyone's beliefs, right? Everyone's respectful. And that's what you have to do. You need to, you know, that's what you believe. Just respect people and, you know, leave them alone and whatever, right? So he said, why are you reasoning these things in your heart? So it goes to show you how Jesus knows our hearts. Jesus reads our hearts, right? He knows this. He knows what's going on. Jesus knows our heart. And there's, here's some scriptures about the heart. First Samuel 16 and 7. It says, God knows the heart. Right? We have 1 Kings 8, 39, 1 Chronicles 28 and 9, Jeremiah 17 and 10, Ezekiel 11 and 5. God knows your heart. He knows your heart. Right? So, if that's why we have to ask God. You know what? God cleanse our heart. Wash us with hyssop. Right? Because in... Yeah, 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 all you want. But in 
inside, if you don't believe it, it's not going to happen. You have to believe this. You have to believe without a shadow of a doubt that God will do it. Will it take some time for some? Yeah, right? Will it take less time for others? Yeah. But you have to believe that what he did for one, he could do for the next. He could do it. How many times has he healed the lepers? You read, you read throughout the Bible, right? So God has the power to heal and to forgive, right? And so I have here the equivalent Hebrew exp um, expressions appear. Um, oh, oh, this is the Son of Man, 103 times in the Old Testament. But that's a whole nother lesson that I, I want to get into. Somebody else is coming in, right? So in verse 11, it says, I say unto thee, look, look what he's saying. He's going to say, you know what? I'm going to say, pick up your bed and walk. God said, pick up your bed and walk. For us, we could say, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven, right? Because we're saying, oh, I don't know. I don't have the authority to say, pick up your bed, right? Because we doubt, right? That's, that's what man would say. That's what man is looking for. But Jesus says, I'm going to say good morning. Good morning. But Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to tell you to pick up your bed and walk. I have power to forgive. I have power to heal. And immediately, in verse 12, immediately he arose. He took up his bed and went forth before them all. In so much that they were all amazed and glorified God. Everyone was amazed. Never saw anything like this before. They never saw anything like this. This is who God is. Pick up your bed because he saw their faith. He saw their determination. He saw the friends connected with him. I'm going to connect with you. You know when people up here and they're doing their shout, they're shouting, and you have someone come up, right, and shout with you. I'm going to connect with you. I know you're shouting. I know you have the victory. I know you are stomping on the enemy's head. You know what? I'm going to stomp on the enemy's head with you. Whatever it is. You're shouting for victory. I'm going to shout for victory with you. You, you go, mother. Oh. Oh. <laughs> She's chilly, right? So you have to have faith with this, right? Faith without works is dead. God is able. He's able to forgive our sins, right? If we committed an offense against each other, I can say, you know what, I forgive you. I forgive you. But I can't stand here and say, your sins are forgiven, right? We don't have the authority, the level like God to say, your sins are forgiven. But what you did to me, I can forgive you what you did. Now, between you and God, right, like David with Bathsheba, right, when he had the adultery with Bathsheba, and he wrote Psalm 51, he said, Lord, against you only I have sinned. He said, God, I, I've sinned against you. In Psalm 51, he said, God, he said, Lord, please put your praise back on my lips, right? Because when you do things, it's hard to praise God. There's no way you can praise God living in sin. There's no way you can't do it. You can act it all you want. You will never have that full fulfillment of who God is. If you're living in sin, you can't serve two masters. You can't do one thing, um, get out of this one's bed this day, and Sunday do whatever. It's just not going to work. You could, you could sugarcoat it all you want, it's not going to work. We've all done it, we've all been there, but this is how good God is. The authority of God says, you know what, I know you did A, B, and C, but I forgive you. Your sins are forgive you. I'm going to wash you with my blood. The blood still works. Yes, yes it does. The blood works. But you have people like the scribes and the Pharisees who stand aside and say, I remember you did this, I remember you did that. You say, I say, I rebuke you in Jesus' name because I'm washed with the blood. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You can't condemn me anymore. The blood still 
works. It worked yesterday. It worked today. It's going to work tomorrow. So if anyone comes in front of you and says, well, you did this back then and you did this, and you say, Satan, I rebuke you. Get behind me the blood of Jesus. Who are you to have some type of Christian authority of who I am and what I have done? Mm. And I said it before, you have these scuba diving sins. They scuba dive and they dive and they dive past all their sins. And they diving and diving and they want to pick up somebody else's sins. Hey, remember you did this? The blood of Jesus. Mm. The blood still works. Get behind me, Satan. You can't come to me and tell me anything. You can't condemn me. I'm in Christ. I've been washed with the blood. Ecclesiastes 16 says, when I was passing by, I saw you lying in your own blood, and I picked you up, I washed you, and I told you to live. That's the God he serves. He told us to live. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He comes to kill our dreams. He comes to steal our hopes. He comes to destroy our family. But God said, I told you to live. I told you to have life, and I want you to have life more abundantly. I want you to prosper, even as your soul prospers. So he wants our soul to prosper, right? Don't just look for things to be prosperous, but let your soul prosper. Seek Jesus. Seek the kingdom of heaven first, and everything will be added unto you. If you seek God first, you can lay down and you can have a peaceful night. Are you going to worry every so often? Of course you are. You're human. But after a while, when through life's experiences, you're going to find yourself more like, okay, you know, God, I remember this scenario before. And I worked it out back then. And I see you're working it out now. You're working it out now. Right? Y'all know the situation with my son. When he first went into the system, I was just like, right? But as time went on, like, I see God working it out. God is strengthening, right? You can't tell me God is not real. It's real. The blood works. God has authority over our lives. All we have to do is have faith, like those friends. We need to be determined. We need to be determined. This is like, oh, well, you know, well, you're paralyzed. Well, I, I hope it works out for you. No, we got to get up and go. And because he was determined and he had friends who connected with him, this man walked away. He walked away. God is good. And thank God for having good friends. Thank God for having faith. So when you see a friend that's lame, not physically lame, but spiritually lame, say, get up from there. Like, what are you doing? Get up from there. The blood still works. God is real. God is a real person. He hears your cries. He knows your heart. He said it right there. It said the scribe was reasoning in their heart. He said to them, what are y'all reasoning in your heart? Now what are y'all talking about in your hearts, right? And he addressed them in their heart. He addressed the, the lame man from his heart. That man never asked for forgiveness of sins in the scripture text, but that's the first thing he said, your sins are forgiven because God knows your heart. He knows your heart. You're walking around, you're walking around. God knows your heart. You're saying, God, forgive me. That's why we have to, God, forgive me. There's some things that we don't even know that we did that we don't even know we did it, whatever. God, forgive me. So he's proved to the scribes, you know what? I have the authority to forgive what you can't see, that sins. And I have the authority to heal what you can see. I can do it all, because I'm God. God is a good God. Yes, anyway, yes. God is a good God. God is a good God. So that's it in a nutshell, right? Mm -hmm. No, don't let no one hinder you like the crowd hindered those people. Don't let no one hinder you from getting to the altar. Don't let no one hinder you. This is a true story. When Darren Sims got saved, Bishop was being ordained to an overseer, I believe, right? And back then, Highway was doing something like 
like everyone's on the prayer line. The prayer line would be like wrapped around the building. So they would try to um, stop the prayer line, right? Because the pastors get like, you know, um, tired, you know, praying and praying. So Darren was getting up and they tried to stop the prayer line, right? But Darren just says, I'm not stopping this prayer line. I'm getting on this prayer line. This is a true story, I'm telling you, right? Darren got on that prayer line, and Bishop Page prayed for him, and he got the Holy Ghost that day. Right? He didn't let the red tape, the bureaucracy, whatever. He said, no, I'm getting to the man of God. You can't let people hinder you. You can't. I don't care how it looks. You know, did it look crazy, y'all coming through the roof? God said, take up your bed and walk. Did he say, well, let me repair the roof? I don't know. <laughs> right? right? You can't let people hinder you. I don't care how it looks, how you, the devil's going to say, oh, you look silly up there. Oh, you're the only one up there. People are going to, I don't care. Because at the end of the day, you're going to stand before God on your own. Your soul, he said, I want your soul to prosper. Right? So God is good. God is good. He's a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. He's a light in the darkness. That's who God is. That's who God is. Don't let no one hinder you. Be determined. I just want to thank Deacon S. Foster. I want to thank Deacon Foster, Sister Gladys, God bless you. Sister Lewis, God bless you. Um, there's more people on here. There's more people. But then they call me Danielle Pasquale. Sister Lewis, God bless you. Does anyone have anything to say? God is good. Don't worry about our internal leprosy. God is going to heal us from the inside. And, you know, as long as we love him, do what he does. Because he is God. He is God. Just let God do what he needs to do. Don't let anybody hinder you from getting to the altar. Don't let anyone hinder you. Right? you got to be determined. you got to be determined. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. Deacon Foster said, hallelujah. My sister says, don't let anyone determine you. Right? Right, that's um, what Bishop said, right? I'll let nothing separate me from the love of God. I love God. I don't care what situations I'm going through, right? I don't always have it. I don't always know it. I don't always know where it's going to come from, but I'm going to love God. Nothing is going to separate me from the love of God, and I'm determined. I'm determined to get to the altar. I'm determined to let God touch me and move in my life. Don't let anything separate you. No hindrance, no obstacles. Amen. Um, missionary Boko, you want to pray us out? Amen. God is good. God is good. Yes, it's the Lord. Yes. God is good. Hallelujah for the goodness of blessing. We thank you for this is good. We thank you for hallelujah being who it is. It's our way maker, our brother's keeper. Hallelujah. Stay steadfast in you. Yes, to stay steadfast in you. 
knowing that you are the good God, to do the right thing, to do the things that will please you all the days of our life. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we praise you in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let everybody say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless you, Deacon Foster. God bless you, Deacon Foster, Sister Gladys, Sister Lewis. Thank you. God bless you, Daniel.